vaccination. Thank you for being with us. We appreciate it. Hi, Chief Hoflick. Good evening, everyone. Okay, I'm the host now. All right. Bear with me while I let people in. We are live on YouTube, so. Thank you, your- Eric. Thank you, Jan. The esteemed Paul Krasinski has joined us. Good evening, Paul. He's connecting to his audio, so it'll be a moment. Okay. Well, they turned me off anyway. Hello, Paul. Hi, how you doing? There you are. Hey, Paul. Hey, how you doing? I was looking to talk to you one day. I hope everything's going good. I was going to put Sherlock Holmes behind me, but I didn't have time to get it out. <laughs> Is everything good, Ann? Yes. Okay. How many people signed in so far? I'm not sure. I am told that there is no link on Village YouTube channel for Public Safety Commission meeting tonight. Eric, do you know how we can remedy that? Oh. That is, I just received that from um, the chief. Okay. Well, I just, I dialed in and I got in. Thank you. Yeah. I drive by your house all the time. I see the snow <laughs> out there. I don't see you shoveling it though. What's going on? I have the, my husband is the best. He is just so committed to bare pavement. What can I tell you? Okay. Hey, and um, the link is there now. Okay. okay. There you go. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. It takes a okay. village here. Oh, we're letting in lots of friends here. Laura Williams. I'll, I'll quit the first business. Maggie Vandermeer. Hi, Maggie. David Freirich is with us now. Our new yeah, Deputy Maggie. Chief Nick Eschner. I'm sorry, Paul? No, I, I would say I'll be quiet now for oh, the other Paul. Yeah, if everybody, I'm going to go ahead. Forgive me. I'm going to mute everyone. So you're going to need to unmute yourselves, Paul. Make sure that as soon as I mute you, you unmute yourself. And Eric, you too. Thanks, everybody. Can you guys all still hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Well, that's pretty nifty. I can I can mute everybody else, but I can keep talking. Um, thanks, everyone, for understanding. We've got a full house tonight. Alicia's just joining us. We've got a couple of students from uh, a one for each from Niles North and Niles West who are coming on. Hi, Laura Williams. I see you with a big smile on your face. Hello. Trustee Roberts is here. How much okay. longer do you want to wait? You know, it's 7.01. I say the world is run by those who show up, so why don't we uh, get the party started? Okay. Mr. Chairman, if you case, agree. In that case, I will call the meeting to order. Thank you all for coming. I hope you're enjoying the weather. We hope nobody is snowed in too badly. And uh, you're getting around all right. First order of business is, of course, the minutes. You've all gotten the minutes. Is there any objections or corrections? If not, the minutes will stand as presented by the secretary. Ann, the meeting is now in your good hands. Hey, Ann, let me read that uh, note. The yes, note. thank you, Eric. Okay, here we go. See if I can get under 10 seconds. Until further notice, meetings of the Skokie Public Safety Commission will be held electronically with a majority of village officials participating via remote access in order to comply with the State of Illinois Gubernatorial Disaster Proclamation. Members of the public who wish to comment as to an item on the published agenda or to comment during public comments must submit their statement or question in writing to the village manager's office and all properly submitted statements or questions will be presented and read during the relevant portion of the meeting. Written comments may be submitted by email to citizencomments at skokie.org by mail to Village of Skokie, Village, Village Manager's Office, 5127 Oakton Street, Skokie, Illinois, 60077, or via the Village's Dropbox located by the public entry to Village Hall. And right now there are no, no messages for Public Safety Commission. So go, go ahead, Ann. Thank you, Eric. That was very, very swift. I appreciate it. Um, welcome, everyone. We've had a few uh, new people come in. Uh, welcome to Trustees Sucker and Ulrich. Jasmine Sevagala has come in, and I know I just let some, oh, Habib Quadri has joined us. So I don't know that I've recognized everyone, but just know that even if I didn't say your name, I see Linda Perlin, I didn't recognize her. Uh, just know that we're grateful for everyone's presence tonight. 
we do have a, a large group tonight. Tonight we have, um, there were 12 community participants scheduled to be with us. So um, a couple of things real quick, a couple of housekeeping notes. I'm gonna do kind of a quick just roll call of the community members who uh, were on the list to join us tonight. I just wanna make sure you're all here. Um, I'm then gonna turn the meeting over to Chief Baker for just a couple of minutes. He has a point about some pending legislation that um, is germane to our discussion tonight that he's gonna go over. And then we'll start our discussion that will center around the three questions that have, were included in tonight's agenda and that have been included in the agendas for the November, December and January meetings. Um, I will say again, just sort of as a broad statement that because we have a full house tonight and we need to keep the meeting, you know, to really no later than 90 minutes, um, if possible, we, I just would ask everyone to be mindful of that, that when we're speaking to be mindful that we do have a large group tonight and it's important to let everyone, everyone speak. And I know the commissioners are, are prepared to just do a lot of listening tonight. So everyone's cooperation is appreciated. Let me just quickly go through my list. I know I've seen some of you, but I just, and you're gonna to need to mute yourselves. Um, Nadia Seitz, I know I saw you. You're I'm here. here. Hi, Nadia. Thank Hi. You. And then uh, Olnior, uh, I'm not gonna say the last name right, forgive me. Um, Olnior Likong Tipan, is Olnior with us? Hello. Hi, thank you. Hi. Good evening, oh, yes, hello. You, are. you were one of our early entrants. Thank you for being yes. here. Um, Laura Williams, I know is here. Laura, we saw you before. Uh, Hi. London. Hi, Laura. London, I know you're with us tonight. Thanks for being here. Maggie. Vandermeer, Maggie, I saw your face in the in the group, so I know you're with us. Um, Jennifer Miller, Jennifer, are you with us tonight? No, I'm not seeing Jennifer yet. Um, Cameron Hussein, Cameron, are you with us? No, Cameron's not here. Uh, Amanda Holman. Amanda is not joined us yet. I'll be watching for her. Um, let's see, we have uh, Ovi Banerjee. Ovi, I believe I saw you. Yeah, I'm here, hi. Hi, great, Ovi is one of our students. Remind us, Niles North or Niles West? Niles North, go Vikings. All right, all right. Thanks for being with us tonight. Um, let's see, I know we have Ashley. Ashley Kiobi, are you with us, Ashley? Okay, not yet. We're still waiting for Ashley and then Habib, Habib Quadri. Right here. I know Habib. Yes, thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you everybody for uh, giving me a moment to do that. And now I'll turn it over to Chief Baker to talk about the pending, the pending legislation. Chief? Thanks, Ann. Uh, good evening, everybody. I just wanted to take a uh, quick couple minutes and uh, just make you aware if you are not aware. And if you are aware, just kind of address um, Illinois House Bill 3653. Um, it was passed by the Illinois House and Senate on January 13th. It was introduced during the lame duck session, they call it. And it was passed um, um, during that session and uh, went on from there to the governor's desk. And it's currently sitting on the governor's desk waiting for him to sign it. He has not signed it yet. And therefore it's not law yet. But as soon as he does, it will become law. Um, what it is, is over 700 pages of criminal justice and police um, reform, if you will, and changes to what is currently in place. And it's far too comprehensive to get into really any of it um, in this forum, because it will take away from what we're doing. But it definitely is going to have an impact on kind of the process that we're in. So I just kind of wanted to, to explain. Uh, part of the, uh, the bill addresses changes in the, the laws that um, that um, authorize use of force and when you can use force. Uh, some of the um, changes in the bill uh, mandate that a statewide standardized use of force policy will be created. And if that takes place at some point in the future, um, any changes we make to our policy will, will be replaced by whatever that is in the future. Uh, what I think is important is a lot of, so I've read the bill twice, uh, it's not an, an exciting read, and it's very complex and um, um, hard to uh, make out kind of the meaning in certain places. But um, what I 
what I take from what I've seen and uh, from summaries is that a lot of the changes follow suit with a lot of the things that have been brought up in our discussions over the months on this topic of this review of our policy. So what I think is gonna end up happening is we'll run and finish our process. We'll take all of your feedback. The Public Safety Commission will um, you know, dive into all of that, make recommendations and file a report and we'll end up, we'll end up making changes to our um, the Skokie Police Department use of force policy. And uh, all those I think will be good things. And um, at some point in the future, whenever that is, because it, it doesn't talk about how they're gonna make the standardized statewide use of force policy, how long it's gonna take to be created, who's gonna do it. Um, so it could take a year or longer, we don't know. Um, but when that eventually takes place, I think that standardized policy is probably gonna have a lot of the things that our new policy is gonna have in it that was addressed by all the same issues, if that makes sense. So I think this is a good head start for us to get um, get going and probably get adapted and trained in the head of the curve um, from where we are eventually going to end up probably anyway, whenever the standardized uh, use of force policy is finally uh, created and issued and mandated uh, through the legislature. So uh, like I said, I. It's, it's far too big and way, way too many factors to really address anything here. I'd be happy to um, uh, answer any questions you have one-on-one -on -one offline afterwards, and uh, we can proceed that way. So, Anne, back to you. Thank you, Chief. Appreciate that. So we're going to dive into our discussion now. Uh, the question, question number one. What specific changes can be made to strengthen the Skokie Police Department use of force policy? And how do you believe those changes will impact the safety of the police, the public, and the subject of the potential use of force? Um, what I will uh, do is to start, um, I'm just gonna open the floor to our guests, to uh, the community members. And I know, I, I forgive me, there are a few others joining us, so I'm, I'm letting them in as, as I'm talking to you. So I don't want to call on anyone specifically, um, unless you like me to, unless I need to. Um, but I would just open the floor to any one of our community representatives who would like to start off this part of the discussion. Again, we will try to keep this, this you know, each section we're going to try to keep to about a good, a, a, a true 20 minutes. So who would like to start? I can start if nobody will. Hi. Thanks, Laura. Laura Williams, nice to see everyone. Um, so our, our group had a couple of things that came to mind. Um, one was other groups have talked about the eight can't wait policies. And, um, you know, I think what you said, Chief Baker, makes sense that we don't know what the standardized policy will be, but I don't think it means that we're going to stop, you know, pursuing what we're looking for here. And, um, we were wondering if it would be possible to bring in a consultant from Eight Can't Wait to sort of help, um, you know, just help navigate what that looks like and what that what that uh, means for our use of force policy. Um, and then the other thing that we that we had discussed actually has to do with something that's in our the current use of force policy. And and you please correct me if I'm wrong, but. I believe at one of the early meetings, it was mentioned that um, when there is a, um, a, a shooting or um, um, I, I can't remember if it's a shooting or just a drawn weapon, that um, the police have a 72 hour waiting period before they um, file a report or make a report because I think it was said that their memory is more accurate if they have that um, processing time. Is that is that correct? Because I won't continue if I'm wrong. Chief, will you please address that? Yeah. So you're referring to our um, um, you know, a policy that addresses procedures after a officer involved death, and uh, after a officer involved death. Shooting or. Well, it could be a shooting. It could be anything. So, okay. Um, any action that an officer takes that results in someone's death, this policy would apply. 
Um, okay. And in, and in that policy, there is a, a, a period of sleep cycles uh, that occur prior to the officer um, that is involved being interviewed. Okay, thank you. So one of the things that we kind of discussed was um, whether that same waiting period is afforded to witnesses or to um, potential victims, for lack of a better word, uh, just because it seems as though if that logic holds true for police officers, it would probably hold true for um, witnesses and um, you know those affected by the incident as well. So that was that was a question that we had that maybe you can't answer now, but uh, we wanted to put out there. Uh, I can definitely answer it. Um, it's not common practice to um, um, have that apply to a criminal investigation involving a suspect. Um, uh, probably the biggest factor involved there is there's a, as soon as you take someone into custody, you know, a clock begins to tick in which you have 48 hours to charge that person uh, before you have to release them. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Laura. Who's next? Any other, um, I just put the question into our chat. If any of you would like to take a look there, it is written down. Um, so the question is there, if any, if any of you would like to review that and again, the floor is open for any of our community members who would like to, to speak. Um, I have a comment. Um, this is Amanda Holman. I'm uh, representing District 68 parents, um, students, and faculty tonight. Um, so I wanted to, while this is not specific to use of force, the question is about, you know, how do we impact safety? And safety, as we know, really only comes about with trust, right? Trust is kind of the foundation. And I'm wondering if there's a couple of things that can be done um, that I think can help lend to the need for greater institutional trust um, to be created. So I love the fact that the amount of data that was provided from um, the department and um, you know, other entities within the village. I'm wondering if um, there can be more rigor around the data that's collected and presented, one in the annual um, police report. Um, you know, in the conversations we had, uh, there's, you know, not really a required, you know, set of metrics, right, that are always reported on. Um, you know, it, it has, you know, evolved as, you know, uh, over the years in terms of the types of things that are listed there. So I think, you know, some more thought and rigor around consistency and how, you know, things are presented, what are other metrics that we feel are important to see and understand. Um, so I think that could be helpful um, just to set the stage, set the expectation that these metrics are important and, you know, that it's not just kind of a, uh, what, you know, administrative inertia, right? That kind of, you know, creates a lot of these documents, but have a little bit more um, structure around kind of what's in there and how the data is presented. And secondly, um, the um, summaries of um, uh, police incidents that were shared, those only really come about through either processes like this or someone issuing a FOIA, you know, Freedom of Information Act request. And so I'm curious, what would be the downside to the department proactively publishing those types of things? You know, we can figure out the right venue, the right place, but instead of having people to either go through this process, which we hope, you know, right, as we learn, we don't have to do, you know, consistent, um, long scale, you know, lengthy processes to look at use of force, these things are published they're published without requiring people to do FOIAs because how many people know how to fill one out and, you know, you know, ask for that type of information. So, you know, while yes, we clearly have media and journalists that can do those things. The reality is that space isn't something we can always trust and lend, you know, um, 
expectations around as much as we perhaps once could. So I think it could go a long way if a lot of this information is just put out there rather than it being requested, rather than having to come through some special processes, because I think establishing trust, reestablishing trust, keeping trust, you know, communication open is really the foundation of, of how we get to safety. And so I think as much data and information we can just proactively put out there without having to require special skills, time, I think is um, a very good first step and a good habit for us to be in. And if I may jump in here for a second, this is uh, Nadia, Nadia Seitz. Thank you, Nadia. Yes, Hi. and thank you, Amanda. Yes, go ahead, please, um, Nadia. I just want to, this is, um, I'm Nadia Seitz. I'm representing the ELL uh, Parent Center um, along with Olinor, Wave Olinor. <laughs> um, I wanted to tag on to Amanda's thoughts, um, something that I was uh, thinking about with regards to the trust issue. Um, would it be possible to somehow showcase the reputation of the Skokie uh, Police Department, like um, to just kind of make it more visible and let it shine and make it available to the community to build on to that trust? So. Not sure how you would do that, um, maybe through that Skokie newsletter that's sent out having, you know, blurbs about the officers or, um, but I, I do agree. I think trust is a big issue and um, making the people familiar, you know, with the officers would be awesome. That's it. Thank you, Nadia. Uh, yeah, just to follow up with that too, I just, um, uh, this is uh, Habib Khadri. Um, and does, does the department right now just trying to get an idea like, you know, when is prevention of a situation of force? So the idea of the, are they tr are some maybe of the, uh, the, the police officers like trained in de-escalating the situation? It's like a one question. And the second one is, do they have an opportunity when they're going to a, a place where they if they know of, of, a, of a household where sometimes there might be a mental illness that causes that? you know, they're not in the right state of mind. Do you guys get some info on that specific thing? And then also the idea of, I know there's been, you know, throughout the United States, the idea of having a counselor around really critical situations to de-escalate a situation where it might, where it might come to a point of using force um, is this kind of um, some thoughts. I just wanted to have a question, I had a question about. Chief? Yeah, thanks, Habib. Um, so your first part of that on de-escalation, uh, we certainly, we don't have anything written in black and white in our policy that says you will de-escalate and you will do it this way. Um, mm -hmm. That's one of the things that has come up um, through these meetings and that's something I'm sure we will end up uh, incorporating. Uh, I can tell you for a fact that we train it though and it's one of our philosophies uh, for the moment someone goes to the uh, police academy to their return to our department we put them through what we call an expanded basic training program we put them in reality-based training scenarios all those scenarios incorporate um, talking to individuals and trying to get them to comply with what you want without having to use force and we reinforce that through everything we do although it is not like i said uh, written down um, anywhere, but it's very much part of our philosophy. And it's also something that we are, because of these meetings and everything else, and, and just seeing the need that we are um, putting together plans to address better and reinforce and um, um, will improve over time. Um, the part of your question about, you know, if we go to a location uh, that might have someone with mental illness or, or some history there, um, do the officers know? And the answer is yes. Um, through our um, computer-aided dispatch uh, service, uh, or uh, you know, system that we use, uh, when we know that uh, we have had uh, possibly issues with someone with a uh, mental health uh, related or, or other issues at a certain address, we'll put an alert on the, the, that address and when an officer is dispatched there, they're cautioned that about the previous activity, just to give them a heads up so they can better prepare and know what they're walking into. Um, and in addition to that, um, 
when you talk about like the mental health part of that, when that caution comes up, we automatically send a CIT trained officer as well um, to help deal with that situation. Um, and that's something relatively new that we have implemented as part of this whole process. <clears throat> and then the last thing about, we brought up counselors. Uh, we are actively involved currently in um, kind of re review and discussions and options and, and philosophies on how we can um, move forward with, um, you know, alternative dispatch or alternative responses to those situations where mental health might be at play or some other issue, um, as opposed to your traditional police response. Uh, thank you, Chief. Thank you. Uh, Ovi has his hand up. Yeah, hi. Uh, Chief Baker, I believe you just mentioned it, but like the uh, crisis interven intervention team or like the training, um, I know it says that to this day about, I think it was like 54 um, officers have been trained in that. And this like, and it outlines how that like helps you deal with the mental illness. And, and if you're dealing with someone, how to deescalate that. And I know that that is um, integrated into the crisis intervention team training. Um, so, I mean, my, I guess my question or maybe my recommendation or, or what I'm asking for is if that can be implemented for everyone, um, every single officer. And I know it said that the ultimate goal is to have all officers trained in that. Um, but I believe you hit on that. If that can be, you know, put in words, like we are going to um, train every single one of our officers in this crisis intervention training um, to ensure that everyone is, it has the tools that they need instead of having to send someone who has been trained and someone who hasn't, you can just send one person out to that situation. Uh, I agree with you hundred um, percent. The issue that we have currently is that um, all law enforcement training has to be approved uh, through the Illinois Tra Training and Standards Board and CIT training is a uh, requirement and in order for that requirement to count, it has to be a uh, Illinois um, Training and Standards Board approved course. The problem is there aren't enough courses to, to uh, meet demand. And um, when a class comes about, we might get two seats in that class. Um, and so it, it just takes time to get everyone through. I think we're up to 60 now. Um, and this past year hasn't helped either because a whole bunch of training has been canceled. Um, and, um, but we're definitely, um, doing everything we can to get all the seats we can and to get as many people as possible, CIT trained and certified as quickly as possible. But that's our current stumbling block. Chief, that, this was the one that we actually had stepped up to host in uh, exchange for getting uh, more seats, right? Yeah. Yeah. We've offered multiple times, um, okay. and, and we have hosted, um, the problem is they like to move it around and make it available geographically to other areas. Thanks, Chief. Okay, there's a couple more hands up. Jasmine, I'm gonna start with you and then Maggie will uh, will throw it to you next. Jasmine, please go ahead. Hi everyone, I'm Jasmine. I'm representing District 69 today. And um, I, I think that in, in regards to a uh, force, I think Ovi made a great point that when the um, police officers are responding to um, calls, to me, it's very, very scary as a black woman when two or three police officers, four, jump out of a car. Like, you know, knowing the history of black and brown people being over-policed and um, knowing that, um, you know, black and brown people are over-policed and over-jailed, like, you know, and so it's and just see, knowing that black and brown people have, have suffered great harm by police officers Every time I see that, it scares me so bad. So I think that that's one way you could um, you could help with force or interacting with individuals, especially people of color. Um, normalize the fact that a lot of people have been traumatized by seeing black and brown men killed by police officers. And so even though there are some really great police officers of every race, like seeing four white men jump out of a car to me that are coming to try to 
supposedly solve a problem, knowing that there has been harm caused to people, it is like traumatic. Like just thinking about that right now, it really um, bothers me. Um, so I think that's one thing you can do. Like when you do go and answer a call, try to racialize, mix the groups racially, the police officers racially. I think that would be a great um, thing to do. And to, um, you know, tell folks, lay back, sit back, wait until like, someone calls you and then come up. Like when like three or four people come up talking crazy to you and not that all police officers do it, but I have seen it happen. And then you automatically get into defense mode trying to defend yourself when, you know, we know that it doesn't work that way. Um, so then another thing that I was thinking is that uh, someone else hit this. I can think it was Habib was the um, de-escalation training. That's the first thing I thought. Like when you see officers de-escalate de um, de situations with white folks, but you see that black and brown folks are not offered that same, um, those same techniques and those skills, because those are great skills to have to be able to stay calm, even when someone else is pretty upset or if they're not. Like we need to teach folks how to de-escalate first. Stay calm, you're speaking to a human being, just relax, you know, and kind of work with that. I think that helps everybody involved because the person who thinks that they may get harmed will relax when they see it. This guy doesn't mean me any harm, right? This guy really is trying to do his or her job. And I know that there are great police officers that are trying to just do their job and not trying to cause um, me harm. Um, and so then I also think that the clear policies, um, I can't remember who was hitting on that, it needs to be said in writing, police officers can do this specifically. Some, not too long, they can do this, they cannot do this. For instance, they cannot put you in a chokehold. Like if that's a case, if that's something I know where we're, I'm working towards, no chokeholds, but specific things that police officers can and cannot do, simple lists, publicize, so that uh, we all have access to those um, do's and don'ts or cans and cannots. And then another thing that I, I kind of thought of, um, you know, when you're a really, really, really little kid and you learn to love police officers, like when I was little, like the police officers came to schools, they talked about not using drugs and all this stuff. And I loved Officer Walton, like he was my guy. He ended up being a tennis player, right? I wanted to go take tennis with this guy. But I saw black officers growing up that looked like me, men, I saw women. In Skokie, I, I really don't see black officers. Even on the bulletin that you all put out uh, of the B cops, and I mentioned it in a letter that I wrote in, everyone was white. So it's like, and everyone was a man. Uh, there may have been a woman, can't remember. Now I have nothing against white men and women. I love them. My best friend is white. One of my best friends is white. But I won't say who she is, but we need officers that look like all of our kids, all of our community. Like it, that goes a long way with families. And I'll just hold off now, give someone else the floor. And um, thank you for listening to me. I appreciate that. Thank you, Jasmine. Um, Chief, I don't know if you wanna jump in just super quickly before we go to Maggie and talk again about the issue with the beat officers. I know you had um, addressed that last month and you know, explaining sort of how the beat, why the beat officers, why the composition is what it is. Yeah, sure. Um, well, like you mentioned, when you look at the beat officers, uh, first of all, you're, you're looking at the permanent day shift beat officers. We call them the beat coordinators. So if a resident wants to know who their beat coordinator is, that's what we have on the website. Um, there's actually a beat officer uh, for wherever you, you live in town uh, for every shift, right? But the ones on the website are just the day shift because they coordinate between the, the three different shifts. Because a lot of times, a lot of the problems will overflow on the different shifts, and the other beat officers need to know about what's going on as well. Um, the reason they're, well, the primary reason that, that they're all white is because the, the, the officers that get day shifts are old, like me. And, um, you know, when back when we got hired, the department, uh, frankly, frankly, was not as diverse as it is today, right? So as you go younger in our ranks, you find much more diversity, which is a great thing. And I think that will continue over time. So when you do look at the, you know, the, the, the afternoon shift uh, and the midnight shift, the diversity is there, but it's not evenly spread out um, just because of seniority and the way the shift picks work. Thanks, Chief. Uh, Maggie, you're up. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm like Jazz, I'm from District 69. Um, I just wanna thank you for all the uh, information that you shared with us. Um, 
I, you know, really appreciated that. I think one thing, you know, that really jumped out to me that, you know, goes along with what Jasmine was saying is um, some of the racial de demographics. So um, looking at the use of force percentages and even just the arrest percentages, you know, we have our, our Skokie demographics, let's just, just talk about say white and black, 60.5% of our citizens are uh, white and 6.6% .6 are black. And yet when you look at the use of force percentages, 38% of use of force cases involve a white person and 45% involve a black person. So the, it doesn't match up there. It's, it's a clear, um, you know, there's, there's clearly a racial imbalance there. Um, and the same is true, like I said, of, of just looking at arrests. Um, so I think, you know, I, I, I'm kind of echoing what other people are saying about the importance of the implicit bias training, the importance of the CIT training and the de-escalation, the importance of having these things in writing. Um, I have a question that is, how can we help with this problem of not enough training? Like, can we write letters? Can we, because to me, it's, it's just sort of, it's like a logistical problem. There's not enough training. Can we get more trainers? Can we hire a trainer? Like, how can we break through that barrier? Because it's so important. Um, and um, I'm also encouraged to hear that you are considering alternative um, response of forms of response or response teams. That was one of the things I wanted to ask about was, um, you know, can you, and they have this model in other places, like I was just reading about Colorado, where they have a police officer paired with a mental health professional or with someone who's an expert in um, substance abuse or homelessness, because so many of these instances are really complicated and, you know, involve um, these issues. And you know, even looking at the one of the FOIA cases that you shared, you know, it was very interesting to see how something that sort of seemed kind of minor could escalate like that to the point where there's an officer with his knee on the, you know, the guy's shoulders and he's saying, I can't breathe. And, and you know, there's obviously he was drinking and things like that. So what I'm, you know, thinking about is the approach you take to de-escalation in different instances, whether it's mental health or substance abuse might be different depending. And it would be so amazing to have people who are experts in these areas to be a part of the team. And, you know, they could train other police officers, but they also to come along and be part of a, a response team. And I guess that's something that I, I really strongly would support. Thank you, Maggie. Anyone else care to speak to this question? If not, we're gonna move on to the next one because it's time. Um, I'm gonna read it and then open the floor, but I'm, after I read it, I'm gonna bear with me, if you will, while I spend a moment just typing it into, um, into the chat box so everyone can reference it. The, the next couple questions are, are shorter. First one is, what do you think police can do to reduce the likelihood of use of force. Now, you know, we've already gone over some of this, um, you know, so there's gonna be some overlap. Let me read it one more time and then I'm gonna type it into our chat. Uh, and I do see we have a hand up, London. So London, I'll get to you in just a second. What do you think police can do to reduce the likelihood of use of force? Um, London, please go ahead and unmute yourself. Thank you. Hi everybody, so I'm one of the representatives from the Laurel Park um, Action Network. Um, several of our points under this question have actually come up already, which I think is great, but I just wanna sort of echo that, that we support the same ideas. Um, you know, the data that you compiled is an amazing resource. And so we would love to see if, you know, there's some sort of annual review of that kind of data. Um, and that, so it would give you guys the opportunity to both celebrate, you know, certain percentages that have come down or things that are working, but also alert you to certain areas that you just simply wouldn't notice if you didn't analyze the data. So we would really encourage that to be part of your regular practice. Um, we're thrilled to hear that you're um, moving towards bringing in mental health uh, professionals more um, 
to be part of your team, which is one of the things we feel strongly about. Um, in terms of training, I know, uh, Chief Baker, you've mentioned that you and some of the other officers are going through the SEED training this year, the anti-bias training. Um, and SEED is uh, really powerful. Um, but SEED training also requires a huge time commitment. Um, and so we were wondering if, um, you know, you could bring something in that maybe doesn't require like the year long commitment, but something that you could offer to your officers, you know, the ones who are interested, um, something in a more compact time frame that might be a little more convenient for them, because I think a lot of them probably would be interested and would really benefit um, from that kind of anti-bias training. Chief Baker, I'm gonna jump in. London, those are great suggestions. Um, the Skokie Public Library in concert with District 219 are offering, a, it's a two-part kind of condensed or mini, if you will, uh, seed initiative. Um, I think they're on, it's at the Skokie Public Library on a couple evenings. I'm gonna look at my calendar, March 11th and 18th. So I know that's maybe something that Chief Baker and I could could talk about if, you know, if something like that could be could be presented to our officers. I think each se session is about an hour. There's two sessions and they were no more than 90 minutes each. So I know that's something certainly that, that um, Chief Baker and I can talk about. Amanda just um, put into the chat, can you remind us what SEED is again? SEED is, someone help me. I, I'm in it now too, and I don't, I'm going through it. I have my meeting, my third meeting tomorrow night and I'm excited about it. It's seeking education, Education on equity, equity and, diversity. and diversity. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Nemes Folder. Would you say it again, just for the group? Seeking educational equity and diversity. Great. I'm going to type it into the chat. Okay, uh, who else would like to speak? Thank you, uh, London, again, for your comments, and Jasmine and Maggie, very, very thoughtful. Everyone, I'm impressed yeah. with how thoughtful everyone is tonight with their comments. Yes. How is, how is SEED advertised? I mean, I know it was through the, uh, you know, the education department when I took it, but, you know, I just noticed that there was not very many people of color, or really there was, I was the only person of color in my group. So I was wondering how we can get it out to, so we can, you know, get a good conversation going, <laughs> you know. I have to look back, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that, you know, I know the, the library does um, publicity on it, I believe. So definitely the library, I want to look, bear with me, I'm on a different computer. I'm looking at the village website. I think we publicized it because registration was in the fall. Um, so I'm pretty sure that it was in the September, October edition of New Skokie. I know it was in the in the village newsletter as well. Um, yeah, Maggie, I'm yeah, thinking about it. That's actually where I got it from, from the ex uh, superintendent. I think she's part of Skokie Cares. From Kate Donegan? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so it is. So it's it's definitely you know something that that we have the villages publicized. I'm just trying to verify, but I'm pretty sure it was in it was either the August September, or uh, or I mean the July August or probably the August September edition. Um, and and Laura brought up a point that I meant to mention. She brought it up in the chat. We were wondering if there was even a way to incentivize the participation with police officers. I don't know if I, you know we're teachers and there are you know, programs that we can participate in for doing professional development to earn credit. Um, is there anything like that with the police department? I'm gonna to defer to the chief on that. I don't know if they need, you know, like continuing education credits, like, you know, teachers and some other professional, um, you know, professions need, chief. So um, this is a kind of a two part answer for, for Deputy Chief, for everyone below a Deputy Chief, there's mandated annual training and there's topics. Uh, so one of them is um, anti-bias training, right? Um, <clears throat> um, for example, and then, you know, youth sports training and the list is, is long. Um, so it's mandated by law, we have to do it. Um, 
you know, we really, we do not have a problem with officers not wanting to go to the training. It's the opposite. Um, they would go all the time if we let them and we, and if we could resource it, you know what I mean? Now, the challenge we have is trying to put all the training that we have to do and then all the training that we think we really need to do into uh, a format that works and we have the time available because we still have to run shifts 24 hours a day, seven days a week, right? And if, uh, if we add more training, that's less people working in the street and that's those officers out there are working harder. So um, there's a fine line there uh, and balance that we have to maintain. And that's really our biggest challenge currently is, and because legislators keep adding more ant mandated training which takes away from some of the training we think we really need to do um, and would like to emphasize more, and we just don't have time to do it. Uh, the other part, I forgot to answer, deputy chiefs and above, we are required to have so many hours a year um, of certified training. Uh, how do you get a question here? Oh, you're muted. Anne, Anne, you're Anne, muted. You're muted. <laughs> who's, who's, oh, heavens, that way would help. Ovi, <laughs> I, and I had, I had everything under control, trust me. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, Habib, did you have your hand up to speak? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to get that hand, hand thing. That's okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I had to, I just a So um, I'm going to go to Ovi. Then I'll go to Jasmine and then Habib will come to you. So Ovi, go ahead if you unmute yourself. Uh, yeah, hi. So I was reading the use of force, like the policy. Um, and, and something that kind of stuck out to me um, was it was under section 2A. It says an officer is justified in the use of any force which he reasonably believes to be necessary to affect the arrest and of any force which he reasonably believes to be necessary to defend himself or another bodily or another from bodily harm while making the arrest. Um, and please correct me if this is like an oversimplification, but like, as long as the officer after the fact says that I felt I was justified and I felt like I did the right thing, they get to, they're sort of relieved of, you know, consequence or, or what does that mean exactly? Like an officer is justified if they believe that it was necessary. Is there any way that that can be some sort of, third party assessment of, yes, that was justified there, that wasn't justified there. Because, you know, if you have in the back of your head, and this, once again, correct me if this is an oversimplification, but, you know, in the back of the head, if you are thinking like, oh, as long as I believe this is justified, and it maybe sort of takes, you know, the guard off, you know, you know, the, the guard comes down and, and you're, you're not really thinking because you know that as long as I believe that I'm doing what's right, um, you know, I can kind of, I'm good to go, if that makes sense. Thanks, Ovi, for posing that question. Chief? Yep. Uh, so I totally understand where you're coming from. Um, I'll make this, uh, try to make this as quick as possible. We actually covered this in um, the first meeting that we had in the presentation, um, but it's probably a good idea just to revisit it. So the rule book, if you will, there, there really isn't a rule book, but but there is the rule book that guides officers on what is reasonable and what is not, and what is unreasonable based on, um, it, that rule book is based on court decisions. So when an officer makes an arrest and uses force, and if there's a, a, uh, a civil action that comes out of that for violation of their rights in an unlawful seizure, it goes to court and decisions are made. And those decisions we are bound by. So when a court, examines a use of force in a certain circumstance um, and says that officer, what he did or she did was reasonable in those circumstances, we are made aware of what those circumstances were and what the result or the assessment was by the court. Um, on the other side, if the court says that it was not reasonable and this is why it's not reasonable, we're also made aware of that. So over time through all those decisions, we uh, amass a rule book of what is the court deems reasonable in certain circumstances and not. And it's guided by three main principles or three questions, which come out of one of the court cases itself, which is Gravity Connor. And it's what is the seriousness of the crime? 
for which you are arresting someone. So is it a, a petty offense um, where they stole five dollars worth of merchandise, um, or is it a homicide and they just you know killed somebody? Uh, it runs the spectrum, but but one of the factors is what is the seriousness of the crime that you are arresting them for. And the second thing is what threat is the person po person posing to you or someone else. And and the third item is what is the level of resistance that they are giving or uh, what is their level of attempt to escape? And it's those three factors the court looks at to determine if the amount of force we use is reasonable or not. So it's very much, uh, we're held accountable after the fact, if someone felt it wasn't reasonable and we're taken to court and the court says, hey, you knew this wasn't reasonable. We've referenced this in multiple cases before. Um, you're wrong or you're gonna be held accountable. Or on the other side of things, what you did was reasonable. And all these court cases uh, have said it uh, over the years. Um, and one thing we do is uh, we have monthly trainings um, where we use a service that uh, informs us and teaches us about the court cases as they're heard and decided. So we can stay on top of, of what the new decisions are um, and we can adjust how we, uh, you know, um, use force, um, you know, as those are decided. Does that help, Obi? Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, we're going to go to Jasmine and then uh, Habib and then Amanda. So Jasmine, you're up and Habib, you're on deck. Amanda, you're next. Thank you so much. Um, I was just thinking about um, how in education, there is something called a strategic plan that guides what you do in your school based on the data. And if the data for the, I don't know if there's some kind of um, plan that the police have in place. I've never done the research, so I can't speak to it. But it would seem to me that the data that Maggie showed, shared with us earlier about the higher percentage of black and brown people being, um, having having force used when they're interacting with the police officers and they're only 6% of the community. I don't think that we can subjectively say that we don't need training. Like we, we need training. The data is showing us that. So I don't know what plan you all use, but I'm thinking that it would help with force in the future if we use the data to make the decisions about what um, training we're going to, um, looking for the correct word, we're going to um, center or say that we really, 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 really need and then figure out a plan to get that training together because it's going to help the community overall when folks are being treated, um, treated well and um, not over police. That helps with relationships with the community and police officers. And also, um, when we think about the fact that the courts have been biased for years and black and brown people have been over uh, uh, institutionalized and even times when they haven't done anything wrong. Sometimes we have to look outside of whatever the court has in place and do what's best for our community. And in Skokie, we know that there are discrepancies sometimes between what a citizen says happened to them and what a police officer says happens to the citizen. And so I think that for me, again, to help us with force and community relations, one of the best ways to nip that in the bud and to clear that up is to have body cams on police officers so you can actually see what's happening in incidents. And then the folks that are in charge can look at the, the tape and make a decision, okay, this officer was right. This officer had to use this force to solve this problem because we know there are instances when you have to, right? Or this officer was wrong, right? And then again, I think too, knowing that the older folks in this police department are white men who have ad, had access to privilege that a lot of us will ever know, will never know, ever. I think that when you are having groups or committees that get together to decide, was this force, was this not, that that group should be um, mixed racially, right, with men and women of color and white men and women, everybody together from different communities because you know, when you have a group of folks that are working together to say this was good or this was not, you're more likely to believe as a person who's a part of a community where black people have been just treated wrong by police officers, you're more likely to, to, to believe a mixed group. 
if that makes sense. And if there's some evidence that you can say, oh no, brother was wrong or sister was wrong or whatever, you know, that force was needed to solve this problem. Or, you know, a group that says that wasn't okay, this officer is gonna be dealt with and then publicly share share some something, not the private information of the officers, but something so we know, okay, we're safe. We're okay. We're gonna get a fair shake. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you for giving me some time. Thanks, Jasmine. Uh, Habib, you're up and Amanda, you're next. Um, it, just just a, a kind of a, Follow up, you know, you know, I was just kind of following up as uh, so Ms. Jasmine has talked about the idea of training and, and no doubt about it. I think that that has to be some, somehow to kind of put that into the, the, the police department's program. Uh, the other kind of just I just, I just want to kind of give you guys as, as an example, uh, I, I kind of work with various communities uh, and in the police department, especially for the Muslim community. So we had a situation about several years ago. So when that situation happened, two, three, you know, some of the community members spoke with the police department and they spoke. And then after that, when did they, when they, I think they had like a, before they go on for beat, they have like a meeting, 20, 30 minutes and say, look, we'll just precisely give you 10 minutes and we'll, we'll break it down into the different ships in about three month process. And what it did is, you know, it kind of gave them perspective from that specific, like, faith-based community. So I think if we bring someone from the black community, the brown community, say, look, this is what happens. Like, just like how, uh, you now got from Jasmine's perspective, like, hey, when some, or if four police officers come, well, this is how I'm feeling. I think just to kind of get a narrative from a specific uh, ethnic group, separate from the training part, I think will also go a long way, especially if a situation that does happen where people who are part of it can kind of share it with their community. And then, you know, you have people with, you know, calm, uh, respectful communication. I think that's something else to kind of think about where even if not just to have those five, 10 minute different groups, of Skokie and say, hey, look, and you have five, 10 minutes, if you could just kind of, if you had your 10 minute uh, uh, opportunity or 15, 20 minute opportunity with the police department, with the different shifts of police officers, here's some things I would just want you to know or keep in mind. I think that could also build that trust slow process as we're doing the data analysis and showing that. Uh, and then also you guys, uh, as you guys are taking these steps right now of having these community meetings, putting a, a new policy together uh, and, and, and moving forward. So, you know, again, uh, thank you for listening, uh, 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 Chief Baker, and congratulations on your uh, position. <laughs> Thanks, Obi. Um, you make a great point. And it's, it's something that we, uh, I'll just give an example. Uh, last year, we brought in uh, to the National Alliance of Mental Illness, um, individuals that had mental illness. And they sat in front of our officers and they told our officers, this is how I feel when I see you. This is, if you talk to me in this way, this is what I don't like and this way, might be how I react. And I, I react better if you talk to me this way. So we've done that in certain circumstances and you, you bring up a great point, so thank you. Yeah, great, great ideas. Amanda, you're up. Um, I was going to say, and just kind of reiterating uh, something that uh, Jasmine said, um, I, I mean, you know, as we have, you know, I hope been paying attention over this past year, unfortunately, the courts are not going to save us from these situations. Um, there's, there's so much that needs to even be done on what laws are passed, who is a judge, how do you get to be a judge, a prosecutor, all of that system, that's the next place that's going to have to, you know, be addressed as well. But I think that, you know, if we as a village, you know, um, have a higher standard than what uh, the courts establish, I don't see how we can ever go wrong because the reality is any of these situations, you know, and I, I'm gonna bring this to um, a dollar and cents perspective, not to, you know, discount or discredit any lives that are impacted um, from, you know, physical violence, but the reality is, if one of um, a use of force situation goes wrong, that's a settlement, right? That the village has to figure out how to make happen financially. And we know that from what has happened this year and the seeds of many things from before, money is not going to be available to take care of these things, you know, in the ways that have been done before. We're not going to be able to afford to pay settlements for misconduct. 
the money's just not going to be there. We have to be very, very honest about that. The education, the infrastructure stuff that the village needs. So to me, you know, while I appreciate the question being framed very much about, you know, what police can do, I think as the village, as the employers, as the people who would be on the hook, should something go wrong, because we just did what the court said at a minimum at the time, I, I think that we could be setting ourselves up for financial issues that we don't, we can't afford. And ultimately, being inclusive and being responsive is about risk management. We are now in the risk management phase of, you know, all of these bad decisions that have come before. So I think that it's never bad to hold ourselves to a higher standard than even what the courts say, because, you know, that's how many, many businesses run. Okay, that's what my insurance will do, but because of these court cases, we're going to go even farther, right? I don't think it's bad at all for us to stretch and reach, and, bad, and I don't think it's bad at all for the, you know, people who are going to be part of ultimately creating this plan to know that we're, this is about financial stewardship also, right, of resources and time. And if these trainings help us avoid these types of things that can be very financially and, you know, reputationally and, you know, uh, damaging to the community, this is where we need it to be. So whether it's incentives, you know, to take the trainings, um, you know, advocating with whatever, um, uh, licensing organization at the state level, uh, Chief Baker, that police have to work with to say, hey, you know, as a village, this is what we're prioritizing for our officers to, you know, to get trained on because this is, this is effective and this is what works for us. Here's our willingness to pay for it because if we do this work well now, right, we are avoiding big problems in the future. So, you know, I want us to try to challenge ourselves to think beyond just kind of what's the bare minimum, what's worked before in the past, because we know that that's, that's not the future we have. We're going to have less money. We're going to have less resources. We're going to have more needs. We got to figure out how to do this in a way that does not impact us negatively financially, reputationally. You know, we're going to have to figure this out. So I think that we need to prioritize training that we know works for our community and, you know, invest those resources to make that happen. Thank you, Amanda. Anyone else care to speak? I don't see any hands up at the moment. Okay, we're gonna, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. And I believe uh, Frank has his hand up. Um, Whoever's on the phone, they're waving at us. I'm not, I think he's just saying hello. Oh, he's muted, so we can't really tell. Okay. Frank, are, Frank, if you're trying to address the group, you're, you're muted. Let me see if I can unmute you. Frank, you, uh, I'm trying to unmute you. I'm, I think you can only mute people, and I don't think you can Yeah, unmute. I can't. You're going to have to, thank you. You're going to have to, un, Frank, I'm so sorry. You're going to have to unmute yourself if you can. He's unmuted now. Mm. Frank, did you want to um, speak to the group? Well, he may be unmuted, but he's not coming through. Yeah. I'm sorry, Frank, we're going to have to try to figure out maybe another way to get your, uh, get your voice heard because you are, you are still muted. If you go to the bottom left of your screen, there's an unmute um, toggle on the bottom left. Do you see it there, Frank? Can you give me a thumbs up? Yeah, yeah. He, he is unmuted. It's just not working. Okay. Frank, you can also use the chat box. If you care to, you can go in and type a message. 
Okay, someone else I think had their hand up. Was there someone else who wanted to address the group before? Um... Okay. Um... I, you know, I, I wish I could fix Frank's problem. I just don't know that I can. Frank, if you can hear me, it looks like you're not actually joined to audio. Um, you'd need to call in or connect to your audio. Okay. While Frank's trying to figure that out, I think what we'll do is move on to our final question, unless there's anyone else who would like to, to speak to the, the second question. I'll read it a couple times and then I'll type it into the chat box and then open uh, open the floor. Um, what do you think the public can do to reduce the likelihood of use of force? Again, what do you think the public can do to reduce the likelihood of use of force? So I'm going to go ahead and type that into the chat box. And if anyone would like to... Um, jump in from our, our community members, please just unmute yourself and go, oh, I do see a hand raised. Laura, yeah, Laura, please go ahead. I'm trying to follow my own classroom rules here. So <laughs> Thank you. That. Yes. Love those teachers. Those uh, great job. Um, so, you know, our group talked about this quite a bit. Uh, again, I'm from the Laurel Park a Action Network. And, um, you know, a lot of people have touched on this already that trust is the biggest issue, right? People who trust the police will call the police for various things. And if you don't trust the police, you're going to be much more hesitant to do so. And so we talked about like, you know, um, are there ways to encourage the community to connect with the police so that they're not only calling the police as a last resort, you know, when there's an emergency? And I know, um, like I use the police non-emergency number all the time. They might be irritated with me. I always leave my name, sorry. But you know, whether it's like I saw graffiti or I saw a woman who was in a house coat on the street and she didn't know where she lived. And so I thought, well, you know, I just don't know how many people are aware of the police non-emergency number and we thought maybe a campaign of some sort to push out the idea of, you know, all the various things that the police can do for us, because, you know, if you have positive interactions with the police, that can only be a good thing. Um, we also talked about um, having neighborhood events, you know, maybe with the beat officers um, so that, you know, the like the National Night Out is a wonderful event when we can have it again. But if you don't live near the, um, you know, the, the exploratorium where it's held, you might not make the effort to go to it, but, a, but smaller events at your local neighborhood parks, people are more comfortable going there. And, um, you know, I've only had really positive experiences with the Skokie police. And I think that's probably true for lots of people but I'm also aware that I'm a white lady <laughs> of a certain age. And so um, I think it's anything we can do to build those relationships and to um, expand people's knowledge of all of the good that the police do and all of the ways that they can help communities um, can only be a good thing. That's it, thank you. Laura, thank you. We've, we've done um, a lot of that over, you know, really, and Brian, jump in, but I, you know, I, a lot of it started, at least um, my involvement with it started um, when I became involved with the Public Safety Commission, uh, when we together developed the Many Cultures, One Community Keeping Skokie Safe initiative. And through that initiative that launched in the summer of 2015, what we affectionately call the Copmobile, um, the very large um, command van it's really more than a van uh, that was going into neighborhoods um, two, three times a week during the summers of 2015 and 16. And then it started going to parks and our police officers do go to block parties 
Um, they do whenever there's a block party. And I'm seeing some of our human relations commissioners nod and smile because they will sometimes go with them. Um, but there's always, always, always more that we can do. So, um, and boy, when, when the pandemic, you know, when conditions are right, um, right, you know, we have a new chief and, you know, it, it'll be, you know, it'll be, it'll be really fun and exciting to see what we can do once conditions allow. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of those things. And I feel like, you know, like right. my kids, when they were little, they loved like the touch a truck and all of that stuff. But I don't think little kids are the ones who necessarily need, you need to be building that trust with. I think that the trust usually, uh, maybe that's a, a fair thing to say is there. And block parties, I know once my kids got to be teenagers, they were like, I'm not interested in going to a block party. So I don't know if, you know, things at parks that might draw, um, you know, high school kids, well, we, you know, high school kids who are on here, like, what would you go out for? Would you go out for a taco truck? Would you go out for, you know, ice cream trucks? Or I, I don't know, you know, I'm just thinking that there might be things that um, hit a different audience where you really get more bang for your buck, so to speak. So, thank you. What a great question. Great idea. Ovi, if you have any thoughts on that, you'd welcome. Um, it totally well, I mean, spot, sorry. No, I mean, personally speaking on this matter, like being involved in these sort of community efforts, it makes me more comfortable because I know that the police department cares about the use of force policy. And, and that actually does mean a lot to me. I don't know about, you know, ice cream trucks. I don't know about, <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff, but community transparency and and reaching out initiatives like this um it, it really goes a long way i can only speak for myself on this because i was in and you know it's only two representatives from the high schools or whatever but um personally uh community initiatives that are reaching out and you know showing support and and being transparent in what's going on um i think that really does go a long way in building that trust which is so important like was mentioned Thank you, Ovi. I see Maggie has her hand up. Maggie and then Nadia, did you have your hand up? Yeah, okay, so we'll go to Maggie and then Nadia, you'll be next. Thanks, yeah, I guess um, this is maybe a bit of a counterpoint. Um, one of my concerns with the idea of building um, sort of, you know, building positive community relations is that that's something that's very comfortable for some people and not for others. And I, you know, when I, read the thing about Cotmobile, I noticed there was something in there about, you know, that it was explicitly stated to the neighborhoods that the van was not there for observation or surveillance or something to that effect. But that was my first thought is how would that feel, you know, to certain communities to have a police vehicle sort of parked there. Um, I think that that experience is very different depending on the color of your skin. Um, and I mean, I, you know, obviously I'm speaking as a white woman, so um, I could be wrong about that. But um, I guess my thinking is more to in, when we're talking about how can the what can the public do is I actually feel like the public could be, you know, there could be a, a campaign to get people to just call the police less to actually not call the police for every uh little thing that you know that that comes up I don't really think that we should be calling the police for that I think that's um and you know this goes in tandem with that idea of having different kinds of response teams like you know if you see someone who looks like they need help could there be someone else you could call this besides the police because sometimes that can lead to escalation and sometimes it just doesn't feel safe for the person who um you know, is, is being observed. Uh, so I guess my thought is um, that actually the public does have a huge responsibility in this. This is, this is um, something that we're, the problem is something we're all perpetuating. And um, I think I would love to see like, you know, these different kinds of response teams, uh, educational campaigns that go along with it. Um, and just that the, the burden of build, rebuilding trust is not put on communities of color. That's that's sort of my concern because I think sometimes when it's like, oh, 
like let's all get along be you know let's have a really nice time together um who's who's kind of having to do the most work in that that's just something i would want to keep in mind thank you maggie um nadia um, I just wanted to circle back uh, to something Ovi said that was um, that kind of caught my eye when he said that, you know, just sitting here, um, it makes him more comfortable um, to just connect with the police knowing that, you know, um, they care about the use of force. And um, if more people had exposure to this, I think that would kind of spread. Um, or that sentiment would spread. And since we have so many community representatives here, um, I think it would be awesome, at least for our ELL parent center where we serve immigrant parents um, in Skokie to learn English, um, to have, you know, representatives from the police come and speak, you know, to, you know, come to one of our classes and just speak and just share, um, to build that relationship that Laura was talking about. Uh, I do think relationship is key. Um, so anyway, that, that, that was just my thought. Thank you, Nadia. Is there anyone else who has any, uh, any of our guests, our community members who have thoughts on the uh, final question? What do you think the public can do to reduce the likelihood uh, of use of force? I know with these kids, I think we can all be responsible for all the kids in the village. Like, I remember one time being at the life at the park, and um, there were kids that were without masks and that were um, they left their cups and their pizza boxes all around, all over the place. And I remember a parent specifically saying, "We should call the police." And I'm like, "They're they're little kids. Why why would you call the police? Just go over there and tell them to pick up their stuff." And that's what I did, and they picked up their stuff and they threw it in the garbage. So I just think that one of the things that we can do to help with like things like that, like having the police called and putting the police in a position to, you know, reprimand the, they were, they, the kids were mostly brown. There were a couple of white kids there. Um, but um, just realize that every kid is a kid, whether they're white, black, brown, Hispanic, biracial, and let's treat them as kids and not let's try to make sure that we see our neighbors trying to, you know, call the police on kids. Let's hope the police officer says to the caller, they're kids, <laughs> you know, just tell them to throw their stuff in the garbage, right? But to just normalize being a kid in Skokie, and make sure it's a safe, safe place for all of our kids to kind of be free and make mistakes and fix them. So I think if the police would tell the caller their kids or, you know, something like that, instead of coming out to kind of get on them for being kids that are unsupervised and making bad choices, that, you know, we can kind of all own the responsibility you know, just just all the for all the kids. Thank you. I'm seeing um, a comment from um, Olnior, maybe promote the Skokie Explorers program in the schools. If we have more explorers to pass on the information to parents, it would help. Yes, thank you. That's a, a real good, good suggestion. I'm just adding that to my notes. All right, is there anyone else? I Oh, I do see a hand, Habib. Go ahead, please. I think you might just brought it up. Uh, one of the things that just because I work with some other school districts too, uh, like in sixth grade, what we realized like middle school, that's when, you know, kids start, you know, they change, their, their personalities change. And we thought before they get to high school, so with, with our local police department there, we have a leads program at sixth grade that every kid has to go through. So at least they get to see two teach, uh, police officers for eight, eight weeks. You know, they're going through different forms of classes. I think kind of gives them just that interaction, which is not confrontational it's just more of a class setting and that gives that opportunity that they, they get to interface with the uh, with the police officer i know you guys have done some amazing things with the shop with the cop and then the other programs but i realize that sometimes at the park it depends if that parents that involved parent who's going to take her him or her there but if you get to the school you get every kid in that neighborhood so i don't know if the public school i don't know what the relationship that is if that is something but i'm thinking that you know not to, you know lower grades yeah it makes sense but that middle school years if you get them by sixth 
But that seventh, eighth grade, seventh, 13, something happens. You know, they always they start having their little, uh, unique personalities and they go through. But if you could kind of get them, I think that helps out. Just as a parent, we go through that as middle schoolers, right? So, and that's when they make those sometimes those quick decisions where not, they're not really thinking well. So that's something else that could happen. And maybe just having like, a, just like this forum with just teenagers, maybe get 15 different kids of ethnic backgrounds from all those junior highs of Skokie and have an open forum like this with the police officers, have a council mediator, you know, kind of make this. And I think that might also change the game where you get some of those influencers of the school. And, you know, and, 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 and I think that could also help out kind of get their feedback of how their, what their perspective is too. You know, it could be from a high school setting and we have this young, great young man that I'm, I'm getting, you know, I just got to see, you know, you know, could maybe get a few other people of different ethnic backgrounds too. So really kind of gives a, a really broad uh, pool of some of the Skokie uh, uh, constituents who are young. And I'm not gonna talk anymore, sorry. No, that was, that was great, Abhi, thank you. Okay. Um, Ann? Yes. Did that uh, pretty much tie it together? I think so. Um, uh, oh, I just saw a hand, London, go ahead. Yeah, I, our group was really just wondering what's next. So we know that um, you're you're going to review all of this and issue a report, I think, in April. Um, what comes after that? And are there going to be more ways for the community to engage with this group or with these issues? Because I sort of echo what Nadia says that, um, you know, it would be great for even more people to be involved and to know that um, this group is looking so seriously at these issues. Um, thank you. I pulled out my timeline and I'm also looking at Amanda's comment, Skokie PD on Twitch for gaming. Um, I've made a note. I, I will admit that being, as Laura said, a woman of a certain age, I don't know what Twitch is. It makes me itch to hear it, but you know, I'm sure it's something cool that I just don't know about that, you know, maybe could be used and my daughter would be horrified to know that I don't know what it is. Um, so I'm making making a note on that and Chief Baker and I will talk about it. Um, so I wanted to just talk briefly about the timeline and then um, I will defer to Chief Baker about other opportunities. And you know, I don't even know that we can we can speak to that right now. I don't know that we can speak to what the other opportunities will be. I, I um, but let me start with the timeline. So our timeline is gonna change just a little bit. Um, the next meeting on March 17th is, um, initially that was when I was going to have a draft report to um, pre, uh, present to the commission. I think we're gonna defer that by one more month um, because the ch it's the chairman's pleasure and the vice chairman that we have some more time for the commission to talk and really discuss what they've heard over the last, what, four or five months now. And, um, you know, possibly even come up with some questions. They uh, want to maybe hear from some police officers as well. So that will take place in March. There might be one more discussion meeting in April. So I'm guessing that the draft might not come until late April or May. Know though that the draft report, however the timing comes out, it will be publicized in the village newsletter in the new scope in New Skokie, and there will be a minimum of a three-week time period for uh, during which the, the entire community will be invited to provide comments. So it will be publicized in New Skokie. It will be publicized in our weekly electronic newsletter that goes out on Tuesday to more than twenty-five thousand individuals. Um, and then after the, the resident feedback comes back, the commission will um, you know, review a final report and then there will be a presentation made to the village board and the results or whatever the final product is will also be publicized, at, will be published and will be publicized as available for the community to look at. So that's just a kind of a real rough broad brush of the timeline. Um, I don't think it's going to extend out, you know, too far, but it, it is going to extend out by at least a month, based on our plans for the next meeting, um, couple meetings. 
Chief Baker, I don't know if you have any thoughts on, um, you know, next steps or what other opportunities might be. And again, I, you know, that's a fresh question. And I think, you know, the chief and myself, and we'll need to confer with the village manager and the commission, commissions, I should say, because we have both public safety and human relations commissioners involved tonight. Um, but chief, any thoughts on, on, you know, where we might go from here in terms of community engagement and community involvement? Well, um, I don't know specifically. Um, all I can tell you is that it's very much a, um, a philosophy of mine and of the department that uh, we understand that we need to be equal partners with the community that we serve. And anything we can do to further that through engagement and conversations and things like this um, is a win for everybody. So we're very much on board. We're looking for ideas. Um, Obviously, we have to, uh, like Ann stated, um, you know, staff those ideas with the rest of the village and the manager. Um, but um, uh, it's very much, like I said, a, uh, a place we want to go. Thank you, um, Chief. I will tell you that I have six pages of notes just from tonight. And um, I come away from these meetings just so excited with different communications ideas. I, you know, I'm already thinking about profile articles of some of our police officers. You know, we just did a, uh, an article about the beat officers, but I'd like to you know, talk to the chief about doing profile articles on some of our other officers that um, you know, represent the community and just a lot of, I, I, so I have a lot of different notes uh, for things that you know won't require a lot of discussion that I can just you know the chief and I can agree and I can can run with them so hopefully I'll I'll be able to do that soon those some of those things soon so I um, really am grateful for I'd like to say just that I'm you know as we wrap up I'm very very grateful to all of you it's clear to me that each and every one of you came to this meeting tonight prepared to with with thoughtful ideas, thoughtful suggestions, and that, um, you know, we all share a love for Skokie and we all are really have the best interest of our community and of our neighbors at heart. So that's just a, a really wonderful thing. And I'm grateful to all of you. Um, is I do see a hand up. Uh, Laura, Laura yeah, Williams, please. You may not be able to answer this at this point, but if Illinois is going to come up with a standard use of force policy, I guess I'm wondering if standard means everyone has to follow it to a T or if it'll be minimum requirements and if Skokie could aim maybe higher in certain areas than what the standardized policy will be. Does that make sense? You know what I'm saying? It absolutely makes sense. And I'm going to defer to the chief, but before he, I do, he might not know. I'll, I'll go, yeah, he might not know. Right. But, but what I can say is that historically, and I'm going to I'm going to kind of become the cheerleader for a moment if you'll indulge me but you know historically Skokie has always aimed higher you know I'm sure you've all heard us say because it's a real point of pride for those of us who work for the village is that Skokie was the first community the first community in the entire nation to have professionally accredited fire police professionally and nationally accredited fire, police, and public works departments. So we've, we have a you know, decades long tradition of, of aiming higher um, for those higher standards. Um, Laura, to your specific question about what the state is gonna require, mm -hmm. you know, whether they're minimum or not, I don't know. Chief, what are your thoughts on that? We really don't know. Um... There's really one sentence in the 700 pages that says the creation of a standardized use of force policy. Um, so we don't know who's going to create it or how they're going to do it or what their timeline is going to be, um, which is why I think this process is, is just as important today as it was when we started. Thanks. Uh, I do see another hand, um, Laura, actually, I think it's your hand still up. It's now down. Okay, any, any other comments before we close the evening, before I turn it back over to Chief Patalis? Chief, I'm the chief now. Oh, I'm sorry, Chief, sorry, I promoted you. Chairman Patalis. Thank you. 
Okay. If not, um, again, I'd like to express my gratitude to all of you and to my the commissioners who are volunteers serving the village and to my colleagues who have been so helpful in this process. Uh, Chairman Patalis, yes, the floor well, is yours. I, I do share your comments and thank everybody for participating. I'm, we're going to take everything that was set into account and work accordingly. Uh, one thing I'd like to leave with you, a little game of let's pretend. Let's pretend you're a young police officer on the Skokie Force. Since you're new, you're probably on the third shift and it's two o'clock in the morning and you're driving alone in your car and a car in front of you is driving erratically so you pull it over, and as you are approaching the driver, the door opens and he gets out, or tries to. That's the end of my conversation with that. I'll leave you with that. Think about the other side of the coin. It's a little bit in your in your thought. That's what I was, all I have to say about it. editorial comment. Thank you all for coming, and with that, we will adjourn the meeting to next month. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all. Good night. Thank you. Take care. Thanks.